the seagulls. Follow Chola. It's because they think sardines will be thrown into the sea. Thank you very much. <laughs> Talking nonsense, so I thought, no, no, enough's enough. Why should I put up with that? Talking nonsense, so I thought, no, no, enough's enough. Why should I put up with that? Don't bite them, double them. Don't bite them, double them. Monday Club is back and it's on a Monday for a change. Jonathan, we start at 9 p.m. 9 being the magic number of this weekend that has just been. It is the Boise boss. Welcome aboard. Jonathan Boyce, how the devil are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks. It's uh, going to be quite the show, I think, tonight. Quite a few talking oh. points, both from, you know, yesterday's performance. We barely, you know, grazed the surface, I don't think, Russell on post-match piss yesterday with Scott and Terry. I think there's a lot more to come to be talked about from that game, which I know we're going to touch upon. And then we've got the small matters this week of a League Cup defence oh, beginning up true. in Dingwall before the old enemy comes to town on oh. Saturday. <laughs> oh, I'm really looking forward to this one. Absolutely, mate. Jonathan, you are revving up the bus like a pro, mate. You're doing my job for me. But it's not just about... What's happening and what we're going to be talking about, Jonathan? Because the excitement doesn't stop there. We have exciting news. If you could see the ticker tape at the bottom, and I know a lot of you read it as if it was on Sky Sports News, Jonathan, on Transfer Deadline Day, you read that ticker tape at the bottom. But we do have the small announcement that we are going to be partnering, hopefully as often as possible, with the guys at Hoops Raffles. So it's at Hoops Raffles. They're on Instagram and Twitter with the same handle. Follow them both. Because, Jonathan, they are tonight's Monday Club sponsor. I have had a good chat with the guys that run it. They're doing a lot of good things, Jonathan. Um, and right now, they, they raffle off signed and framed Celtic shirts. They allow you to win valuable Celtic memorabilia, Jonathan. Sometimes it's for a tiny amount. It starts as little as £3 in some cases. I've seen someone won a Joe Hart signed jersey, Jonathan, for as little as three fifty just the other week. Uh, all you need to do is send over the money. I'm going over the raffle card, which has like 40 teams. You know the old teams cards, Jonathan. Um, once that's drawn, they do it on a live stream on their Instagram channel. Uh, and obviously, when you're buying a raffle team, Jonathan, not just that, you're donating to charity as well. Um, this is their page on Instagram, Jonathan. I'm delighted to be working with like-minded people as well. We love all that. But yeah, if you want to take part, this is the most recent one, Jonathan. Look at that for a frame to have one. Yeah, it was ten pound, beautiful. Ten pound per team that one was. But look at it. You know what I mean? When you actually look at the the optics of that, that is a pretty snazzy prize. Ten uh, percent was donated to a charity of the winner's choice, which I thought was cool. Um, they do a collection in Glasgow Airshot, or you can pay it for the courier. 
Um, and it's been signed, Jonathan, by both Kyogo and Jota. That one, that is a prize. I'm glad, I'm, I'm gutted we weren't on board before, Jonathan, to think promoting that would be easy. But ten pounds, what, what a bargain you can get there as well. Ten pounds for a signed Kyogo shirt, not bad, yeah. is it? It's a belter. I mean, I liked even that one. Joe Hart's obviously a talking point for tonight's discussion. Look at that. 350 is all it costs, Jonathan. Oh, you could have had three teams in the car for just nine pounds. So you could have won Joe Hart with three quid. That's frightening. Wow. That well, not actually Joe Hart, but a Joe Hart signed jersey. But yeah, give the guys a follow on Instagram at Hoops Raffles or on Twitter at Hoops Raffles. Uh, I'm glad that they got in touch. They they approached us, Jonathan. <laughs> when did you ever yeah. think that would be happening? People get in touch with us, looking to work with the Boise bus. But what I want to do for them as well is leave the wee, uh, you know, leave the ticker tape running, uh, promoting their page as well. And hopefully some of you will be getting involved. An exclusive reveal though, Jonathan, they've allowed us to do as well. They will be tomorrow announcing you can win either a signed Kyogo or a signed Jota shirt individually. Take your pick if you're a winner. They'll be announcing that on their Instagram page as of tomorrow. So you're gonna to have to give what, me a minute, Russell. I think I need to get myself onto Instagram right now and start looking this out. The Monday call needs to be postponed for five minutes just to get I me know. in this raffle. I know. So they are going to be announcing all the details of that on their Instagram and on their Twitter and other social media pages. But yeah, uh looking forward to working more with the hoops raffles. Enough of that though, Jonathan, because also I need to ask you guys. We went out live tonight on Facebook. On Twitter for a wee change as well, just to mix it up, Jonathan. Maybe get that wee bit extra reach. And of course, we're live on YouTube where you can obviously hit the subscribe button, hit the like button if you're on the social pages, hit the share button if you want to become a Boise Bus member. It's £1.99 a month. The same as what a patron would be. Ours is optional and we do a hell of a lot more shows than you normally get on a patron as well. Jonathan, Celtic Football Club, 9-0. Eyes are my eyes. Uh, you know, was it all a myth? Was it... Did that actually happen yesterday, Jonathan? It's one that's going to go down in history. We tried to cover it the best we could on the post-match piss last night, Jonathan. But to be completely honest with you, it takes a second look because that score is no lie. 9-0. Never seen anything like it. No, I know you're having to almost rub your eyes in disbelief. And it's a very interesting point that's been brought up with the actual uh, comment screen that's been pulled up there. Is there no penalties? There was no red cards. I think the last time we did a a nine was against Aberdeen back when Mark McGee was managing them. And I think they might have had two penalties that day. They definitely had a man sent off two, I believe. And to uh, be fair, so Mark, McGee, Mark McGee in charge, Jonathan, was already, you know, you're 3 0 up. Do you know what I mean? So I don't really count that one as much. No, I, I certainly wasn't the same. Yeah, he is a, he's a daft nugget, him. He really is. But it was a, a swashbuckling um, display. Yesterday from Postacoglu's men, it was totally different from what happened uh, the last time we did match the nine pass somebody. Completely different performances. The yep. uh, the players' performances from you know right through from Joe Hart who has the big moment right at the start of that game, all the way through to Kyogo up top. There was nobody who really put a foot wrong, was there? No, no, Jonathan. I mean, what I mean, what 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 can you say about? It? I mean, foot's wrong. I mean, there was not not not. What really, really excited me, Jonathan, and we kind of touched on it yesterday, but I've watched the goals back actually numerous times today, like a sad hole, but I couldn't I couldn't help myself. See the through balls before the cutbacks for the goals. That's been the difference. And I will say it, even Aaron Moyes dink over the top at one point for one of the goals was half decent. It's the most impressive thing oh, in the Celtic jersey. Wow. I've, I've, I remain unconvinced by him. I, I've got a, you know, I, there was a comment on the channel, Jonathan, by a guy called Tom. I call him Thomas now. Um, I'm very disappointed, Jonathan, when I see someone saying, I'm underestimating based on his nationality because he's Australian. Uh -huh. I find comments like that really, really poor because that's far from the. In fact, did we not say yesterday, I want to be convinced? I just, he'll need more minutes in the park for me to convince them yeah. for the time being. It's, I it's a strange one as, as well, Russell, because I think last season one of your favourite players probably played for Australia, did he not? The Was one he not that's Australian playing slippers? Australian, he, he, Australian slippers? slippers are, we kangaroos on those slippers, I think, from memory. Mm. Um, he's still, still looking for a club, I think, you know, as well. We'll take him back. You know, you never know. But uh, I, when you're talking about the performance of yesterday, there was so much to like about it. Um, and particularly when you uh, think of a bad as, you know, pass for the first goal, it's it's incredible. That was probably, for me, the best one 
out of the, the sort of setup plays. It just yeah. takes so many players out of the game. The eye, you know, it's got to the eye of the needle to actually be able to pick that pass as well. Um, I, I liked O'Reilly's dink for one of them um, too. I thought that was a good spot, uh, you know, as well. And it's just, it's remarkable how many of these goals we're managing to get as cutbacks across, you know, the box and we're getting these goals in at the back post. It seems to be happening almost every week under Foster Coglu. It's something that's absolutely frightening how much work must get put into that and the players still manage to find the space because opposition teams must be fully aware this is what we try to do, but they don't seem to be able to find an answer, do they? No, Jonathan, because this is the thing. This is what, you know, I think we're ahead of schedule, honestly, with this Ange Ball philosophy. Whatever it is he's trying to push out, Jonathan, the group of players he's actually got are on message, mate. They get it. They just get it. It was a team you were watching executing a game plan, Jonathan, but just time and time again, there is no answer for it domestically as far as I'm concerned. And I'm going to go as far to say, Jonathan, as if we can execute it like that on Saturday, there'll be no answer for it then either. That is how I feel, Jonathan. It is not mm-hmm. me trying to be disrespectful. It's not me trying to always go, oh, they're shy. We're Celtic fans. I try to be balanced on this programme, as you know, or this programme, show, whatever you fucking call it. But, you know, I try to be balanced, Jonathan. I've given them praise, and I, I think they are a good team. I, I think if that Celtic shows up, though, there's only one winner on Saturday. But there was so much to be enthused about with the display, Jonathan. Um, when you're seeing... Obviously, the hard work that happened over the summer. I'm going to go back to a point we spoke about a lot at the time because we didn't really have much else to speak about because it was, Jonathan, a long... I don't know if I've frozen, but did you freeze there? No, you, you kind of cut out a wee bit, but it's okay. No I worries. can still hear yeah. No worries. Um, but during that pre-season, that long pre-season without games, Jonathan, let's be honest, it's quite clear what's happened in that time. Ange has came to the fore. This is, we were told, this is when he's most at home. It's when he's on that training ground. And I think you're seeing Celtic. I think Jack Ross, the Dundee United manager, described some of the goals as training ground goals against mannequins. (laughs) Jack, (laughs) Jack Ross described it as that. But you know what? I think the training ground element is absolutely spot on. That is guys, Jonathan, that just understand the message that's getting delivered to them. And I've worked and been given, Jonathan, the time to do the work. The point I always go back to is, doesn't this just even uh, more and more, Jonathan, emphasise the, th- the thought process? They just qualify for the Champions League in the group stages every every year. Make sure you're in there. Make sure we don't have the stress, the drama of these crazy away trips, Jonathan, because yeah. the proof is in the pudding. 9-0. At this stage last season, Jonathan, we'd played three games away from home. We'd lost all three. Right now, Jonathan, I think we've scored 17 goals in three away games. 12 months is a long time in football. Yeah, I mean, the, the difference is unbelievable um, from where the club was, uh, you know, 12 months ago. There was a lot of question marks getting asked um, as to where we were as a club after the first three away games of last season. And it was looking as like it was going to be a very bleak campaign because it wasn't even just the fact we weren't getting results and performances weren't there either. Whereas now you're looking at it 12 months on and, you know, we're almost disappointed it was only nine yesterday, to be completely honest. We were, we were probably looking at it and thinking, referee, we need about, you know, five minutes here of stoppage thing to give us a chance at, mm. at the 10. And he only gave us, he only gave us one, which was uh, frustrating to say the least. But, you know, you also think about it, we got nine goals and, you know, Giacomacus wasn't even in the squad. Russell, who's another one who's usually, well, top goal scorer last season for us. Um, and you've got to fancy, you know, if he'd been on the bench, he'd have probably fancied his chances of bagging a couple when he would have inevitably, yep. you know, came on. Um, that scoring could have been anything. That was the most scary thing about it. And, you know, I've seen today a few people are now turning around on Twitter and saying, oh, Celtic should be taking their feet off the gas. It's almost disrespectful to the other clubs. It's like, oh, come uh, on. I, do you know what? Do you know what? See, when you see some of that pish, I, mean, I listened to the, the, you know, for my sins, to the old super scoreboard Jonathan tonight. I actually quite like listening to it. I've said that on the channel before. But I listened to it, and one guy said he thought it was out of order Celtic doing that to a young Dundee United team once they knew the game was already won. Could they not have stopped? I mean, tell me he's not a Rangers fan without telling you he's a Rangers fan. I mean, shut up, mate. But good news as well, Jonathan. The good news just keeps flowing tonight on the bus. The positive energy is flying. There's over 100 live. We're only 15 minutes in, and Scott Melville has just become a member on YouTube. Welcome to the bus, Scott. 
Well, Have you? Involved, mate. As always, it is an optional thing. It does help support the channel. We want this to be a self-sufficient channel that actually we still have intentions of growing moderately and slowly. But to do that, we do need it to be self-sufficient. So thank you very much, Scott Melville. Massively appreciate it. But Jonathan, just forget all that. That see to me, that's just hate, jealousy, envy, and fear when you hear those sort of comments. For me, it's just nonsense. What Ange did, I think he showed empathy towards Jack Ross as much as he shook his hand walking along the track side uh, before the game. And he probably said, you know, you're in a tough spot, mate. You know, I've been there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> proceeded just to put his foot down on the pedal. Ange gave it a wee bit away. There was a post-match interview he did, uh, I think it was on Sports Sound, Jonathan, and he generally kind of said we knew they were vulnerable. And it was something on the lines of, you know, it was up to us to kind of... To take advantage, yeah. Aye, like... I think there's more. I think that's remember that's his polite version of events mm -hmm. on national radio. Jonathan, he's giving you a bit of insight there. We knew they were there for the taking, is what he's saying, and we went for the throat. And Angel then commiserate with with uh, Jack Ross about his precarious position. I'm sure over a glass of wine after the game and say, "You'll be all right, mate. Hang in there." But sorry about the ninety minutes. We don't stop. It's that simple, Jonathan. We don't stop. No, I, why should we at the end of the day? Because, no. you know, how close it was last season. There was every chance last season could have ended up going down to goal difference. Exactly. There wasn't a lot in it. And I suggest there won't be an awful lot in it again this time around because the gap between Celtic and Rangers and the rest of the clubs is only getting bigger with both clubs now having the, the Champions League windfalls coming in. You're going to see them pull away even further uh, than they, they have been for a long, long time. Yep. So, you know, every goal could be absolutely crucial. Uh, this season in the league, because I fully expect this will this will go the distance once again. Um, but you know, looking at it from how how hungry we were to continue to score, and I touched upon yeah. it yesterday, it's just the fact the players were still going hammer and tongs trying to get those extra goals in. You know, even once they were four or five nil up, they were still hounding Dundee United down and pressing as if they were bloody drawing the game and were needing a goal that their life yep. depended on it. Um, and it's so refreshing to see because I. For the life of me, Russell, I can't really remember many Celtic teams being quite as relentless as this when they get into those types of positions. I've seen, obviously, Celtic getting themselves four or five goals up, and, you know, relatively early in games on, on numerous occasions, and then they end up taking their feet off the gas, and it just ends up petering yep. out, you know, maybe the second half, whereas this was the, the total opposite. It was actually more of a case that they, they started, <laughs> I say, they actually started slightly slower, which sounds a bit ridiculous when they won 9-0, but they almost started about maybe second year in the first half an hour, and there wasn't an awful lot mm -hmm. in it. And then, you know, Dundee United were, were more than in the game in that first half an hour. We were completely in control, of course. But then once we got the second one, like Kyogo hits that thunderbolt into the top corner, we just decided at that moment, right, we're going through the gears here, and we're going to see how much damage we can do. And it was, as you say, a warning shot, because I think, Russell, there's going to be another team that's on a very similar scoreline before this season is out, at least once more this season. I think the 10 will be hit this season, Jonathan. I think it's worth it. If you if you can afford it, you can gamble responsibly. Stick 50p each week on us winning 10 now. Or Celtic to score 10. 50p a week. I think you'll make it back. I think, well, you'll more than make it back the week that it comes in. I think it's so, so achievable for this team. That is based, though, Jonathan, not just on the ability of the, the, the players that we are fortunate to be able to select from. And we're going to talk about the options in the front three because Haksibanovic, that just went right under the radar, you know, he, he did a press conference today. Um, but it's not just about the options going forward, Jonathan. It's about up here. It's the attitude, Jonathan. When you've got fullbacks like Greg Taylor sprinting to take corners from a full no up, I think it was Terry that highlighted that yesterday. Yep, this is what we want to see. And as Alf... Alf comes in and says, so rightly, five goals in the second half says it all. How often, Jonathan, have we seen over the years, you go into halftime with one of those unassailing leads, it's not going to be caught up, you're miles in front, the job's done, it's foot off the gas time. Celtic scored yeah. more goals in the second half than they did in the first, and they made yeah. full changes in that second half. That's what you're entering into. This is almost the silly season now. And it's so easy, Jonathan. It's so, so convenient to now go down the road of, oh, the gulf between the big two teams is really big. And, you know, Dundee United, they're absolutely a shambles. This isn't, you know, these are, yeah, in individual points we can maybe discuss. 
let's be honest, Jonathan, the harsh reality is when Celtic play like that, they will blow teams away domestically, no matter who they are. And the biggest test that we can have in this league comes on Saturday. I feel extremely confident about that. We will preview that game at more length, obviously, Jonathan, as the week goes on, on the Boise yeah. bus. There was one man who got a hat-trick, though. And we spoke yesterday about Conor McCann's reference, saying the Waynes have a hero like Henrik now, you know, <laughs> and it's been a while since we've had that. I've seen various articles now saying there are no doubt this is now the guy who, you know, is going to get that hero status, the most hero status, or maybe even just the best centre forward since Henrik Larson. Loads of, I'd say articles, loads of Facebook and social media posts that I've seen suggesting that. Jonathan, let's say Kyogo does stay fit between now and the end of the season. How many realistically does he score? We know Henrik peaked at 53 goals in 2000-2001. Yeah. Unsurprisingly, once Chris Sutton was made his foil. We know after that he scored over 40, I think it was, in his next three. Absolutely yeah. stunning. Stunning record, you know, of, of goals. We know Lee Griffiths managed over 40 under Ronnie Dyla. Uh, he did, and it wasn't yeah. a great Celtic team when he managed over 40. I think Musa's first season, he managed, he just crept over the 30 mark. How many can kill? I, I think Chris Commons got over 31 year as well. Um, yeah, in recent memory, his first, one of his first seasons, I think he might have done. Yeah, his first full season, believe it or not. In the year we didn't get the 10, I think Odson Edward managed 25. I know people think he was shite that year, and he, he probably was underperforming. I think he got something like 25 goals. How many can Kyogo get realistically, Jonathan? We're going to be playing a Champions League campaign, a League Cup campaign, a Scottish Cup campaign, and of course, your bread and butter SPFL 38 fixtures, which he started five out of five, I think it is so far. He started them all, wasn't it? Yeah. So, yeah, how many can Kyogo realistically get if he is to stay fully fit? Let's have some fun with this, Jonathan. And, you know, whilst we're not trying to predict the future, as like, you know, we're not trying to be, you know, Nostradamus about it, we're just saying, you know, as a bit of fun, what is he capable of, Jonathan? Uh, I would say the sky's the limit, really, with Kyogo. He could score as many as he wants if he starts every week. I mean, I would suggest, you know, 40 is certainly achievable for him. Uh, and I think that's probably something he's going to be, be looking at as, as a, a sort of starting target point. How many? Um, I think he can get to 40 easily. I think he can get to 40. I think he can get to 40. I think no, he'll go above 40, to be honest. I think, I think he'll probably score over 40 if he was to play consistently week in week out starting matches and doesn't uh, pick up any injuries i think the only um thing that could stop him slightly would be the fact that jackamakis i think will probably need to start some games uh just because of the, the volume of matches we're going to have i would imagine there'll be a bit more rotation in the team uh over the next few weeks now that the midweek games are going to be beginning in earnest from this week and then i think they'll probably almost midweeks all the way up until the world cup kicks off um, at the end of november I believe so. You know, that could scupper Kyogo's chances for goals, but even coming off the bench, you know, would you really rule him out of still nicking one or two possibly if he comes no. on and gets half an hour? Absolutely not. Uh, so for me, if you're looking at it, I think he's going to have a big impact this season, Kyogo. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, in terms of Europe, I think he'll get a few in the Champions League as well. I think he'll probably get two or three uh, in the Champions League too. Uh, I, I just think he's, he's, his movement and his, his intelligence yeah. as a striker is just, it's all there and he scores all kinds of different goals. And I think that's why a lot of people can liken him uh, to Larson because he is kind of like that sort of figure that we can, we can depend on. And you've got to remember, we go back 12 months, like we're talking about there, it was actually a full-blown crisis whenever he was injured in the first half of that season. That's how quickly the fans took to him and realised oh shit, he's essential if we're going to win this league championship back. And it was no coincidence when he wasn't playing in the first half of that season, Celtic dropped points quite regularly at that time. Now, they're in a far better position now if he did get injured, of course. Of course. However, it still doesn't deflate the fact that I think yeah, people have bought him for so early. Oh, sorry, you cut out there. I didn't catch what you said. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what happened. It's all went a wee bit out of sync, Jonathan. I don't know what went on there. I think it was uh, at my end as usual. Um, I, I called Kyogo the Player of the Year last year, you know, and I'll tell you why because just to the points you just highlighted there, you're spot on, Jonathan. No Kyogo that first half of last season. No party, no title party. Oh, absolutely no. No nothing. He was crucial. He started this season more electric, electrically than what he did last season. I don't even know if that's a word. 
But it sounds good. And you know what I loved? Uh, Scott Cameron, I think it was in the comment, said he loved his reaction to the second goal. Well, the first goal, I know Paul McFarland, good to have you on the bus, Paul. He said, yeah, good to see you, goal, Paul. He said he, he stuck the tongue out, but it was actually the first goal he did the tongue yes. out. Yes, yes, he did. Goal. I didn't pick up on that until today when I watched them back. It was very lost in it, wasn't it? So he also did something else, which the unique angle ca captured. And I love that. So he obviously does, you know, the, the sort of house symbol. Yeah. And then Just once it's all calmed in, he turned back round to the fans and he went, one, two, three, like that. And I thought, mm -hmm. he's got a bit of personality to him, Kyogo. Then what I love for the second goal, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reference Larson again. We need to get a klaxon for him, actually. But see that goal? I give you, Jonathan, the League Cup final 2001. Larson did it with his left peg. Ball just breaks mm -hmm. outside the box. First time, just curl it top bins, won't you? You yeah. know, can you picture the goal I'm talking about? The yellow yeah, strip? Yeah, I can just, yeah. The just yellow strip. Remember, honestly, He's got the, the hat trick. The was, yeah, that's right. The one you always think about in that game is when he runs from the halfway line, which is where I mean, just going to first. I was like, when did you go do that the weekend? But no, no, no I no. get exactly what you're When the ball breaks, the ball yeah. breaks the edge of the box and he just curls it. First time hit into the roof of the net. If that's what Kyogo did there, if that's his instinctive eye for goal, Jonathan, his instinct is to curl it like that from 25 yards out. I think we're absolutely right to be talking about a, a, a player, if kept fit, that could potentially hit that 40-goal-plus mark. It is exciting times to have a guy like this, by the way, because I think right now, uh, obviously, you know, we spoke about this in the summer, it being a concern. How often did we have Kyogo and Giacomac as both fit last year? Very few, very few occasions. It's very much a game of two, two yeah. halves in that season, uh, really, to use that cliche. The first half, Kyogo's heart, and then the second half becomes Jack and Marcus has to step in. And, you know, we're blessed that we've got two extremely good strikers at the club that can really, uh, you know, both bang in goals left, right and centre um, domestically. And it's what uh, obviously was so important for us in terms of winning the league last year. But, yeah, if you're going back on it, it was absolutely a case that Kyogo stole the show in the first half. And then Jack and Marcus mm -hmm. came in in the second half when he was injured. <laughs> and the scary thing was, yeah, I actually almost forgot about Kyoko at times in the second half. And that's just a grid of how good Jack Amakis was. And now you're seeing him back again. How did we forget we didn't actually have him for most of the second half of that season? But let's count it, Jonathan. We just scored nine goals yesterday. A record ever in Celtic's history. A wee win. No Jack yeah. Amakis in the squad. I know. I know. And, and that's what you think. <laughs> if you have the two of them playing, you know, even if one's coming off the bench and we put in a performance like that, I, I think the whole digits will get hit. You know, as well, because I could see both of them easily scoring a couple of goals each. And then the amount of other threats we have in the wide areas. Oh, there's just there's so many potential goal opportunities across that front line and the attacking options we have. You could you could talk about each one of them individually and say what they bring, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. to the table, all of them. Uh, you know, even if you're looking at the likes of Abad and Jota, uh, you know, O'Reilly, you're probably expecting them to get good, you know, goal returns, uh, you know, as well over the course of the season. So... It's, it's all looking good, and that's before you even add in the new boy that's came in. Uh, you've still got James Forrest, who's kind of lurking behind the scenes, and he does usually get on the score sheet. James Forrest every season at some point um, or another. Granted, his powers might be diminishing somewhat compared to where they used to be, but honestly, I, I, I can't remember the last time I've seen this much attacking threat in a Celtic team for yeah. so many different individuals. It's frightening, Jonathan. The thing is, as well, I mean, you're looking at it yesterday and it's the carbon copy element of the goals that I was touching on at the top of the show. That's what really impresses me. You know, Abada, at the end of the day, yes, he did the dink. He didn't need to do that dink. That was just a bit of flair, Jonathan, for his hat. You know, yeah, was that his hat trick goal? Was that his second? I can't keep up. But, the, you know, it's the fact when they come in at their back post, they do this offside to onside movement, which I just love. Do you know how you get away with doing that offside to onside? You know, because I'm offside in phase one of the play, but I'm onside for phase two. Do you know how you do that, Jonathan? If you've got complete faith in your teammates to get the rest of it, the, the rest of the move right, that's what you're seeing. That cohesion, Jonathan, takes a hell of a lot of fucking work and a hell of a lot of faith in your teammates, Jonathan. That is what you're watching Kyogo offside, ball goes across, a badder plays it straight back in. Kyogo, I think Mark Kearney put it up on Twitter. That clears that one up. Anyone suggests they're offside. He's with two and a half yards on. But when you watch it in real time, you think, oh, is he on the brink there? Is he, is he maybe offside? 
It's very. Oh, it just seems another thing, though, as well, though, Russell. Like, who cares about these offside goals? I think, in some ways, some people are just looking to counter that based off uh, events that happened to Ibrox the day True. before, and we're just clutching at straws. It was ridiculously petty. Who cares? It was like the fourth goal before you even had a hint of offside and on any of them. And, and they weren't. Were that's, the, that's the thing. I think they were, they were obviously they were close, so that's why people start making these comparisons. But, uh, you know, it was all legitimate goals that were actually scored uh, in the game. And, Honestly, when you're putting nine past somebody, let's not turn around and start looking at the referees and linesmen and thinking they've had some big impact on where that result was going. Because Celtic, oh, even if they had oh. ruled them out, you know, Celtic would have just found different ways to have scored anyway. There was nothing stopping that Celtic team. They don't stop, and the referees would not have been able to stop them, even if they were having a shite day at the office. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's just something that we, we can overcome, really, any sort of issues we have as a team, whether that be a, a stuffy, difficult team to break down, or whether that be, you know, a linesman that just wants to yep. put the flag up constantly. Celtic have the answers for me domestically to any question that officials or, you know, opposition want to put up against us. Jonathan, it's not just that as well. I mean, bring on the VAR. That's meant to come in now after the World Cup, they reckon, November, December time. I cannot mm-hmm. wait for it to be a mockery. I can't wait to make a mockery of it. I cannot wait for guys like Chris Boyd to be sitting there spitting feathers, hopefully doing cool commentary. Get him in the commentary box, Jonathan, and quickly calling offside for some of these goals. And before you know it, VAR just nails it like that, going, no, he's, he's miles on. I think the movement, the intelligence of the movement, the likes of Kyogo's making it, and not just Kyogo, a bad mate putting a masterclass display yesterday. I thought he was incredible i mean he pops up in the pitch for that first goal in the center you know you know in the halfway line jonathan you know and plays a thread through ball that you know eye of the needle stuff mm-hmm. it wipes out five united players but then you're looking at shot is cut across for kyogo is he offside is he not keep doing these vr replays i cannot wait to see the lines jonathan appear on that screen because you're now it's going to highlight just how intelligent these people are that is the honest truth, mate. Um, Hank Savanovich, though, Jonathan, is the latest to arrive at Celtic. He did his press conference today. He said he was watching at Tannadice, and all you could think of is he was desperate to get on the park. Jonathan, I'm sure going to see how he gets on the park. It's a lovely notion to have <laughs> Hacks. What is it Scott Kelly called him yesterday? The Hacksaw. The um, Hacksaw. I think we'll think use that. I quite like it, the Hacksaw. Yeah, Hacks the Hacksaw. Yeah, Scott Cameron will call him Hacksaw. <laughs> but... He's going to need a hacksaw, Jonathan, to try and cut a position in that team because right now, uh, you know, getting a bad in at the start line, it took five games, Jonathan, for him to get his first start. He's now sitting with three goals and an assist. He's like third in the, the goal contributions charts in the whole league already. Um, uh, it's more than now... that. Ross County as well, so it's, it's sorry, even more mate. than that. <laughs> yeah, so I uh, sorry, you're right. Point. But Maeda must be sitting there now going, well, how do I get back in the team? James Forrest is sitting on 96 club goals, Jonathan, a new three-year contract. I think he's got 90-odd assists as well. And then Haksavanovic joins the party. I mean, yeah, you could be excited watching the team and thinking, how could I contribute in that? How does he get in this team, Jonathan, right now? And this isn't a dig at Hacksaw. This is just welcome to maybe the toughest challenge you've ever been a part of, mate. I uh, well, it's, it's certainly not going to be uh, easy for him unless it turns out that he is somebody that is a, a, of another worldy of a footballer that's just coming in and turns out to take us to a whole new level. And let's hope Paxo is uh, another one of these players that is just going to be a step up if that's possible. So I'm struggling to find uh, ways that our team could possibly play any better. And he's definitely going to have his hands full, uh, you know, usurping any of the uh, the individuals that are currently occupying those roles and I think you know you've hit the nail on the head with Abada you know and how much patience he's had to show to get his first start uh, of the season there as well so I think you know it's certainly going to make it a little bit more interesting I don't know if Hacksaw has really been brought in I know he's, he's a natural winger it'll be interesting to see if he's one of these guys that can maybe play centrally make a bit more joy possibly well, getting he, in. He openly said today Jonathan his favourite position is left wing you will be doing well and and you know what maybe you will get you know maybe this guy's that uh, maybe we always say the team can always be improved jonathan if he uh, improves what we've got already firstly 
fair fucks to him. But secondly, left wing <laughs> of all the of all the front three roles I could think of, I'd have said that'd be the hardest. They openly said it today at the presser. Yeah, oh, he's, he's going to have his hands full um, in that position with Jota anyway, so that could be quite the uh, quite the battle of Hacksaw turns out to be as good as uh, we all hope uh, he does turn out to be, but, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised. I, I would imagine Posta Coglu must have plans there, uh, and he may even be looking at possibly moving somebody through the middle uh, with the amount of wingers he has now, Russell, and I know me and Mark Kearney discussed it previously on the bus, the possibility of leaving James Forrest may end up moving in one for the games that he possibly ends up playing in um, and, and start trying to adapt his game a bit, considering he's probably not mm-hmm. going to be quite as fast as mm-hmm. he was. And, and for Forrest, his main attribute has always been his pace. Um, and when that starts to go ever so slightly, he might find he's a bit more suited to playing through the middle. Time will tell. That might not be what Postacoglu has in mind for James Forrest. But it's interesting because they gave him the new deal. It does make me think they see, obviously, a future for him somewhere. Um, at the moment, you would have him probably your know, last choice um, as a winger, which is crazy when you consider where Forrest was, you know, even just a few years ago, that he would now end up finding himself fourth or fifth choice um, winger at the club now. Um, and it just yep. goes to show the strength and depth that Celtic yep. have, which is a brilliant thing. And to obviously be able to, to call on stuff like James Forrest potentially starting in a game, you know, in the League but Cup John, on Jonathan, Wednesday. Jonathan, you're talking about you know, moving one in a central position. But as King Manny Kang says, we know Manny Kang well, uh, Manny is saying, Jonathan, Matt O'Reilly, he's the man for him. He's a great player. If you want to move one of these guys in, Jonathan, in one, are they really yeah, but Matt O'Reilly the team? <laughs> really? yeah, well, it's, it's the conundrum that Ange Bosso Goblin has. It's not as if there's anywhere that's weak. And of course, no. even Manny makes, a, Manny makes a brilliant point. It's good to hear from Manny. Um, but it's it's one of those ones you just you you look at it and you think maybe there's a little bit less competition in that the sort of number ten role and maybe that might be a bit easier to get into if you're up against O'Reilly and you know Turnbull could obviously play there. Nova McGregor could go up one potentially as well, and you've obviously got Hattie, Jonathan, you know this. Jonathan, 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 you'd lead me on to the next point so easily. How is it easier to get a Manchester United linked Matt O'Reilly out the team than it is any other position? I think Matt O'Reilly right now is playing, dare I say it, Jonathan, with Danish slippers on, you know? I think yeah. right now he is, a, for a 21 years old, who came from League One in England, he is cutting about, Jonathan, with a style, a calmness, a, a, an awareness, Jonathan, and then all the technique in the world as well. Uh, he, he got two assists yesterday. Um but he felt like he was involved in everything good that we were doing as well. I suppose, you know, most of the team were. Jonathan, he's getting linked to Man United today. It was Liverpool the other day. Apparently, obviously, the Man United ones have ramped up. I've seen that uh, everything Celtic, they tend to post a lot of the rumours and stuff like that. And they, they posted saying that it's uh, Man United today that are linked with Matt O'Reilly, Jonathan. Folks are talking about 15, 15, 20 million pounds. Let's look at the facts here. Once that Anthony guy signs from Ajax, Jonathan, Ajax will received from Man United alone this summer 170 million euros between him and Lissandro Martinez. This is a league, Jonathan, uh, that according to Regan Stevenson, he phoned me today to give me this. He says, the Eredivisie teams, Jonathan, Eredivisie. Eredivisie, yep. Yeah, i got to get the Arthur Newman impression in. The Eredivisie. But apparently that league only makes six million a year in TV money, Jonathan. Whilst the the SPFL is two point eight, two point six, something like that million yeah. a year. Mm-hmm. This isn't a league that's a million miles removed from ours, Jonathan. This isn't a league that just had a team put out by one of our teams, is it? You know, I don't talk about Rangers as our, but they come from the same league as us. They've just put PSV out of a team. How are they able, Jonathan, to command these sort of fees? Whilst instantly, I want. You know, initial reaction is to a Matt O'Reilly potential still would be 15 to 20 million. I think fuck that these days, Jonathan. I think it's time you start putting premiums on these. Start using Ajax as a template and go, well, what's the difference here? What is it? What, what is it? You know, and before people say, oh, they consistently compete the, the, the latter stages of Champions Leagues, etc. Let me just say one thing. That Martinez scored 10 goals last year, Jonathan. 10. Yeah. 10 goals. You know? 
I think that is not, you know, a striker worthy of a hundred million euro fee. But there they are, they're willing to pay it. It's time Celtic. If anyone wants any of our superstars that are, you know, you know, beginning to become one of these teams, and I know Ryan Taylor wants me to say Kyoko, like Ange does. <laughs> uh, I think all you know, anyone that's a regular in our first team, Jonathan, we just stick that Man United premium on them and we start or the Ajax premium, if you want to call it that, and we just start going, it's not a bother. But we know what you've got in your coffers. Stop taking the piss and making out you can't afford the big bucks because it's us that you're talking to. Stop being damp squib Celtic. Except we're in the Champions League now. We're in the big boys' playground. If you want to start bidding for our players, let's start bidding real term money, Jonathan. Let's start bidding Ajax player money. What do you make of that? Yeah, well, I think it's certainly something Celtic should be looking at, particularly when it is the uh, you know Premiership <laughs> clubs that are coming looking. At them for you know, uh, I think you know, particularly if you look at the Man United example, Man United spent lots of money, and a lot of that money has been spent on dross over the last few years. And uh, one reason for that is because of the fact that the clubs that have been selling know Manchester United have a lot of money, and they know if Manchester United really want their player, it's not an issue financially for them, they'll get them, you know, they'll get them <laughs> because Manchester United are such a wealthy club. It doesn't really affect them too They much. always have a... But, Jonathan, see, since Alex Ferguson was there, just to be, quickly come in, Man United are aware of that when they enter the transfer market. There's a Man United premium put on it. A Man United tax, if you want. That, that's a, that's been the case since I've been football. I, I think it's got even worse, uh, though, with how much... The, the, maybe it seems that more it's got worse just because of how much money's now involved yeah. in the game than even compared to when Ferguson was managing Manchester United. And it was only towards the tail end that football fees seemed to be getting astronomical. Um, to me, anyway, was when about Ferguson was was leaving Manchester United. You know, I don't know Ronaldo obviously I think went that. in his time. Yeah, well, I would I would say certainly for most of his spell as a he manager, spent, Ferguson. He spent just under thirteen million on Dwight York in nineteen ninety seven or nineteen ninety eight. Nineteen ninety eight would have been. That was twenty four years ago, Joe. That's a hell of a lot of money. Yeah, it would have been a lot of money back back then. But I, I guess I don't really associate Ferguson as much with it. But that's not that's, that's not really the argument anyway. Yeah, uh, they get the taxed about, anyway, a Man United they, premium. They, they do. A Man United sort of club or, or similar in England would get, uh, you know, hit with a, a much higher sort of fee. Although having said that, you know, when you're looking at clubs we've sold to, similar to Manchester United, you only have to look at Kieran Tierney and Arsenal are in a similar sort of bracket in terms of they've got that reputation and everyone knows that they've got money. And Celtic still only managed to bring in, you know, £25 million pounds uh, for the sale of Kieran Tierney, who's you know the best used product that I've you know seen us produce um, in my time following the club, and um, you know there's a, a big case there to be said that Tierney, you know he was playing in the Champions League, putting some good performances, and they are everyone yep. can see his talents. You know there's still a debate for a lot of fans as to whether or not he's better than the current Scotland and Liverpool, you know left back and Andy Robertson, and you've got to believe Russell, you know if Andy Robertson or Kieran Tierney were to move in the next couple of days, that fee would be astronomical um, in terms of the money involved. So yeah, I agree with that. No, there's, there's absolutely no reason that Celtic shouldn't be trying to hold that. I think Celtic are one of these clubs so that they just sometimes they see the money saying that they're just too quick to deal. Um, and I think that's why we let ourselves down a little bit in terms of getting that money. It's almost if we kind of just like, if we get around that 20 million mark, historically that's really what it's always been. If we get around that 20 million pound yeah. mark, then we're quite happy just to set that as the benchmark and it's almost like, well, why don't you try and, you know, get a bit more for your for your buck when you're selling somebody? I know some things, situations do take the control themselves. Like, for example, Dembele wanted out after the sort of China situation when his, mm -hmm. his sort of transfer occurred. But there are other times, you know, where I think with Tierney, Celtic probably could have played a bit more hardball and they would have probably found that Arsenal would have ended up paying more money uh, you know, for them. I think they sometimes get concerned that the first time one of these big clubs come in, that the player might come chapping at the door and they end up mm -hmm. not getting another bid and then they end up being concerned they're not going to end up getting the deal that they originally had and they're going to be stuck by an unhappy player or they're going to end up having to sell them at a lower price than was originally offered because agents have got wind around that somebody's unhappy. But, you know, if Ajax are able to get the sort of money that they've been, you know, getting for a number of years, Celtic and Ajax are similar type clubs and you know it's a great point that Stubbs is making that you know if Tierney didn't play him for Ajax you know Arsenal would have spent you know closer to 60 million possibly yep. even higher than that so 
it's one of those things that, you know, Celtic and Ajax should be very similar in terms of European Absolutely. football and pedigrees. They should be very similar in terms of how far they're both able to go in Europe because they're both similar sized clubs. I think Ajax is always a good example um, to look at, but they shouldn't really be the benchmark. That should be like a, a team that we should be feeling like we're on a level playing field with, both on the pitch and indeed with transfer dealings off it. Um, you know, I, I take obviously Ajax did get to a Champions League semi-final only a few years ago and their, their youth academy is renowned for producing top talent. Um, but I think a lot of it is just to do with the fact Scottish clubs don't always necessarily, for me, believe that they can get the high money that goes about elsewhere in football. And I think we're a bit of a defeatist nation when it comes to things like that, Russell. And that is why we don't end up getting the sort of deals that perhaps we should be getting. I think you're spot on, Jordan. I, I completely subscribe to that. Chris Sutton is a wonderful ambassador for Scottish football in that way. And I know he rubs up the other the other lot the wrong way at times. But you know what? A lot of the time it's just factual, Jonathan. But Sutton's been banging that drum. I remember when, you know, I've said this a few times in here, Liam Boyce in Moose and Dembele's best season for Celtic, not because he's a Boyce and it's the Monday club, but <laughs> Liam Boyce actually outscored Moose and Dembele that 2016-17 season. You know that? He was the yeah, top Yeah, I vaguely remember that Boyce was the top goal scorer. That's right, yeah. So Moose and Dembele, who we were already at that time valuing at 20 million for his, you know, his exploits, Actually, a guy in a far lesser team, Ross County, outscored him in the league that year. What did they sell him for in the 2017 summer? Oh, what was it they sold him for? £500,000, Jonathan. Yeah. Now, it doesn't matter if you're Ross County, Aberdeen, Celtic, if you're the top scorer in Scotland and you came above a guy like Moussa Dembele, who it takes two seconds to watch his reel, and you, all the, all, everyone knows of him anyway, and you're finishing above him in a lesser team, why on earth would he be a 500,000 player? And I think you're right. It's not just Celtic that have undervalued players. But when I see teams like Man United, and yes, maybe they've got a unique situation, Jonathan, where they are bowing to clubs right now and they're bent over a barrel because they just simply need bodies in and it's the 29th of August now. I still think there's an example to be made there, Jonathan. Where we've sold players on deadline day. Hold the club to ransom that wants them. Hold the club to ransom. If not, we'll yeah. keep them. The player will get over it soon enough once you go back and play at Paradise and you get 60,000 cheering you on. You know? And 170 million euros Man United have shelled out on two players from a Dutch league that I don't think is all that better than the Scottish league. I don't think has, you know, a, an incredible pull to it that should make... Two players worth 170 million, where the luckiest Celtic could get selling two players in a summer would be the equivalent of 40 to 50 million. They're doing 100 and what is it in pounds? It's crazy when million. you think about it like that as well. You, you know, not that disparity so just, between us. No, well, you, just, you don't have to go that far back. To, you know, obviously Rangers not at PSV, but Dundee United, the same Dundee United, we just spanked 9 0, also beat AZ Altmar at Paradise. Exactly. Uh, you know, one nil. <laughs> Granted, they got cuffed in the, in Holland, but they actually won the game, and they were good value for their win in that match. That wasn't a snatch and grab. They were very good value um, for the win in the first game. I think that was where people thought that the United were going to have a good season, um, and you know, it's it, it never really worked out that way so far for them. But I think it goes again to show just how impressive Celtic were uh, yesterday in their performance in that game. But you know, teams like Dundee United are beating their better teams at Tanadice, then why on earth? And, you know, Rangers are knocking out their second best team in the Champions mm -hmm. League. And, you know, I would look at, you know, Rangers and Ajax probably as 50-50 games in the group that they are both in now. I don't funny, think there's going to be a lot of those that, games. Eh? Yep. You know, but somehow, you know, when it comes to selling players, Ajax will get three to four times that of what we would get for selling one of our key players. It doesn't add up really, does it? Absolutely not, Jonathan. It's time that that changes. And right now we know we're in a position of, you know, we're in a vantage point, Jonathan, now. Um, where, you know, there is money in the bank, there is cash reserves. We don't need to sell anyone. So if anyone wants to be sniffing about Matt O'Reilly in the next three days, whether it be Man United or anyone else for that matter, it's time to cough up. It's time to give us the money that you would be happy, happily shelling out to a Sevilla, an Ajax, you know, a Leon. Some of the, the prices that come to Portugal as well, Jonathan, I've said this before, you know, like, you know, Benfica seem to just be able to stick a, you know, a 20 million add-on on it, all the normal fees. I mean, David Luiz, well, it was over a decade ago, I think he cost 35, 40 million pounds. 
You know, you look yeah. at you look at the Benfica, the amount of players they've sold for thirty million plus over the years, and then you look at the league they're playing in as well, and you go, yeah, okay, it's better than the Scottish league, but is it that much of a golf? I don't think so. So whilst we don't welcome any rumours for our players, the one thing I will say is financially we're in a sound place right now, and I also just feel there is now so many comparable examples. None more so than those two Ajax players to Man United for 170 million euros that our big boys, you know, in the director's room can start looking at. And when it comes to negotiation, use as templates and use as examples and say, oh, hold on a minute. You know, how highly do you value him? You know, uh, and yeah. then give the examples of the goal records of that Alexa of Anthony. 10 goals, 100 million. Well, I look at Kyogo right now, for example, say it was him. You know, you don't want 100 million. Just start with that. Tell them you want the big boys bucks. Starting like a big club. But we don't welcome any of the players being looked at. I just thought it was quite insightful when I seen those. Do um, you think it might get better now, Russell, with the fact that obviously we're back in the Champions League group stage as the winner of the Scottish Premiership again. We'll get automatic qualification next season. You know, if European exploits continue to improve, then you're maybe potentially going to be looking at Champions League group stage football becoming a more regular occurrence going forward, giving Celtic oh, that true. additional cash. Would uh -huh. that then potentially mean that the club would surely be in a position where they could then start demanding those higher fees? Because I guess from the club's perspective, the reason they're maybe also selling on the cheap is because when these players are being sold, it tends to be seasons where we've not qualified for the Champions League group stages. Um, and, and that's where they're now trying to make up the shortfall of that money they've lost out on. And I mean that, which, which then goes back to the old, why didn't they spend the money to begin with and make sure we're in? And then... You don't have to worry about selling your key players for anything less than what they should be going for. Jonathan, the benefits of qualifying for the Champions League season in, season out, no, no bounds. It is unbelievable. You have to explain to little fannies at times, you know what I mean, who just don't want to, oh, no, we can't afford to do this, we can't afford to do that. Fuck off. Celtic, over the last 12 years, should have made the Champions League far more occasions yeah. than they did, if not every occasion they did, if they just had had a little bit of belief and give themselves a little push and stop peddling narratives of financial disparity, gulfs, and also Mission Impossible, bullshit like that. You know, the other mob have proven that to be nonsense. The gulf isn't actually anywhere near as big, Jonathan. And had we believed that over the last 12 years, firstly, we'd be out of sight of our rivals. Secondly, Jonathan, the, the player valuation we could put on our own assets, the spending we could be able to do, and the valuation of the club as a whole, the turnover, etc., We'd all be a completely different stratosphere for the one that we talk about right now. However, it's too range just to get back to the big time for us to seem to want to pick up the ball again. People want to call that me being negative. Bring it on, I don't care. It is the facts. We have been reactive to our rivals' uh, situation, and it looks like we're reacting positively again. No shock there. We've yeah. seen it all before. Hopefully it continues, Jonathan, but I will never not look at the last decade to 12 years without a bit of regret. Chris D comes in. Why would you gamble and leave if you are O'Reilly? Here is your one chance to play against right. I don't think Matt O'Reilly's joking to leave. My argument to Jonathan, though, is of course, if Man United come calling, players do they do their head turns. You know, anyone is Man United is the biggest brand I still think in European football. Um, they have already on Madrid. Take the pick. It'd be interesting though, because if he went to Man United, he might not play um consistently. But what if Man United like... never phone you again? Well, there's two ways of looking at it, yeah. You you know, go it's, to it's one of those ones, how much do you back yourself though, if you're going to get a chance against Real Madrid putting a good performance there? There's plenty of other clubs are still going to be interested in you of a similar ilk to Chelsea. Manchester United. And Tell me I've as I said, fun. As I said yesterday, Manchester United are not the same club that we grew up yeah. watching. They're not, they're, they're not as strong as they once were. We um, know that, Jonathan, but they, just, they still get guys to leave the European champions to join them. Casemiro just left Real Madrid as European champion as a first team regular to join conference, the Conference Cup Man United. Yet the draw is still too big for Casemiro to turn down. Varane last summer joins Europa League Man United from European or, or former European champions at that point, La Liga champions, Real Madrid. Man United, Jonathan, I think as a pool, you are underplaying based on what you see on the pitch. They are the, I still think, probably the number one most famous club in the world. That's my worry. If Matt O'Reilly was offered Man United, he takes it. But I just think Celtic need to make sure these guys have been secured, as have many under Ange, which I love, 
on long-term deals. Matt O'Reilly being one of them. If you want to go to Man United, we'll not stand in your way. Not that he's angling for a move to Man United. I mean, if Man United made a bid and he let it be known he wanted to go, which he would if Man United did make a bid, then let's just make sure we get the right money for him. I think I'm back to the deal being correct. Um, if Manchester United were to come in, I don't think they will. Anyway, I presume it's all going to be media talk. And it's all yeah. quite convenient. It's all convenient to me that this media talk is happening in a week before we play Rangers that uh, seems Absolutely a couple of our key players are now being linked away because that seems to happen on a fairly regular basis when we have the rivals coming up around the corner, which is a very interesting coincidence. I think that's a great point, Jonathan. I think there is undoubtedly Project Fear cutting in, uh, cutting in again, Jonathan. And believe you me, the Project Fear is because the fear is there. 9-0, I said it yesterday, is an intimidating scoreline, Jonathan. But it's interesting because we are about to enter, Jonathan, a mouth-watering eight days. It's a mouth-watering mm. eight days ahead, Jonathan. The League Cup, as you say, we go into defending champions against Ross County away from home. We seem to like scoring goals away from home right now. I don't hold out much hope for Ross County. And hopefully, hopefully, as you were talking about the other day, you know, Martin O'Neill liked to rotate it um, in, the, in these trophies. Oh, Martin O'Neill, was that Martin hey. O'Neill? Back in 56 minutes. I know, as I got him. <laughs> but was it you? Was it you who was saying? Or was, it, was it you? Someone was saying, anyway, there was a lot of rotation done in these com- cup competitions under O'Neill. And if we hadn't, we'd probably have won more trebles. He just kind of, I wouldn't mind if, Post the call does rotation this week. See if we went out. I wouldn't be, you know, panicking at any stage. Not because if we rotate, we necessarily go out. But I think I would put rotation at the, the, the forefront here right now. If it were me, I'd be making sure someone like Tony Ralston gets a start. You know, because you don't know if someone could pick up an injury before these games. You can't have them just coming in completely from the cold, you know, from yeah. pre-season to, to a month in. So I think it's a great opportunity to do some rotation. We all believe in the depth of the squad right now. So, you know. Put it to the text. Then you've got the weekend, Jonathan. They come to town Saturday, not Sunday, Saturday, midday. Mm. Um, a very exciting match, a very exciting fixture, an opportunity for, you know, what has been an all, you know, sweeping aside Celtic side so far um, to go five points clear. And, you know, I think that'll be the attitude. And I, I'm quite confident that it'll be what happens. Um, and then just four days later, Real Madrid. Now, whilst I wouldn't have any compromises with the two teams that start those games, you know, you pick your strongest 11 for both those games. Ross County an opportunity to give some of the, let's be honest, Jonathan, more unlucky players a chance in that first team. Uh, I'll start with Alston, but he's one of many unlucky players, Jonathan, in that lineup. Abada was an example who came in at the weekend. Yeah, I think there's there's so much uh, options there to actually go and, uh, you know, play some players that haven't had a lot of minutes yet this season. I think. Uh, there's enough depth in the squad. The squad's going to need rotated. You're talking two huge games after Ross County and Rangers and Real Madrid, where I wouldn't anticipate Postacoglu will make uh, too many changes. Yeah, Axel on Wednesday. Well, Axel's Axel available for Wednesday. Axel is second. Scott's came up with a fucking belter of a name for him, by the way. Um, but, you know, if you're looking at the actual uh, the squad depth there, I think they should be making five or six changes. Uh, what do you, you think of that front three from Sui? Yeah, I, I, I'd like to see Jack Amaka start, provided he's fully fit and recovered from his illness that he had yeah. over the weekend. Then I have no problem with him starting. I think that makes absolute sense. I think Abada deserved a start after getting his hat trick uh, at the weekend. I still think there's a very high possibility he could start against Rangers and we go for the throat and drop Maida um, in that game. So I think Abada makes sense to start on Wednesday because he can continue his good form there. It's very hard to drop going into the Rangers game. Uh, and yeah, Maida's another one there that just he's consistently quite good at just giving you another option. Uh, Jonathan, ooh. you know, in the Monday Club, right? We like to go to the comments. We like to bring in points. Obviously, the TNF is you know the Thursday night forum. We really, we really go. We double down on that. But I've got to bring this one up and put you on the spot, Jonathan, because it's been a while since I've seen you sweat, young man. So the question mm-hmm. comes in from Chris Boy sixty two. And it is an absolute honker of a question. It's, oh, it's horrible. If you had a choice, Jonathan, would you rather beat the Rangers or beat Real Madrid? Um, Real Madrid. Real Madrid, quite straightforward, I think, for me. And I think the reason why is 
as much as I'll be seeing something totally different on Saturday at half past 11 in the morning, I'll be properly in the mood for that, that sort of game as we all kind of get into on the day. We don't want to lose to them or give them anything, really. If I'm looking at it, taking a step back from the, the whole emotions that go around the Derby match, uh, being Real Madrid would be something that, I'd, you know, you might never get to see that again in your lifetime. You know, we've waited this long to even play against Real Madrid. That for me, if we were able to, particularly getting back into the Champions League, make a massive statement and beat them at Celtic Park on match day one. Oh, oh wow, that sets up the group well. I mean, obviously, we don't want to be dropping points to Rangers, but, you know, there's there's plenty of games going to be left either way, whatever happens in the derby on Saturday. Nothing's going to be won or lost in terms of the league. For me, depending on what happens mm-hmm. in that game, there's still going to be another three of those pictures to come around for us to correct anything that, mm-hmm. that might go wrong. So if you were turning around to me and saying, the cost of uh, beating Real Madrid is you're going to have to either draw or lose to Rangers. I'd, I'd, I'd probably take beating Real Madrid. It's I mean, I'll, I'll so put you on the same split. spot. Oh, okay. yeah, yeah. For me, Real Madrid. I'd rather beat Real Madrid. I don't care. I'll see Celtic beat Rangers another hundred times in my lifetime, right? Yeah. I'll right. see us win another twenty league titles in my lifetime at least. How many times will I see us beat Real Madrid? It might only ever be this week. So no. Anyone who anyone is entitled to their opinion. A lot of people prefer that league domination, that domestic dominance, and always being one better than Rangers. I'll see us beat Rangers, uh, you know, loads of times more in my life. And I still have faith if we don't beat Rangers as well, which I think is a very important point, Jonathan. If we don't beat Rangers this weekend, I still think we win the league. Beat Real Madrid, might qualify from that group. I, I, no, but I mean, obviously. It's a fun question. I know there's people coming in saying, both, both, why do we want to win both? It's not... Oh, of course. I mean, if you're giving me both, I'll take both. That wasn't the it's question, not, though. It's a bit of fun. <laughs> having, you know, it was meant to be devil's advocate sort of question, I think, from Chris Boy 62 So we need to indulge it a wee bit. That's all. Um, you know, the option was pick one, one win over the other. For me, Real Madrid, because it might be the only time I ever see it in my life. Firstly, Jonathan, it's the only time I've ever seen them. Mark's disagreeing. He says, but to be fair, what is the actual oh, game being Real Madrid? Well, my football, my football and life, Mark, is based on memories. Um, my sweetest memories of Celtic fans, the road to Seville. What was the point in that? Didn't win, fuck all, really. That's kind of last and it was a waste of time. But to me, it's the sweetest season I can think of was, was watching us smash those teams. And yeah, I'm sticking with it. So I... I think even when you look at it as, as well, the iconic European games can stand out more than, you know, games we've beaten Rangers in where you've beat them maybe, you know, 1-0 or something at Celtic Park. You don't remember them as much when no. the time goes by. But, you you know, you always remember beating Manchester United 1-0 at Celtic Park. You always remember beating Barcelona 2-1 um, at Celtic Park when Tony Watt scored uh, towards the end of that game. You know, these are memories that last a lifetime, whereas Rangers games can be remembered very fondly depending on what happens on the day, of course. But there's so many times that we play them, we couldn't just turn around and say, you know, if we were to go and sound the claps in the Martin O'Neill era again, Russell, you probably couldn't list off the top of your head every single Celtic victory against Rangers, even over that time period. Maybe you could, no. but that's over five years, and there's probably one or two that would get away from you. Yeah, and just totally. weren't good games of football. Totally, mate. I just think, see, for me, I just my 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 radar is beyond Scottish football, Jonathan. Other people's isn't. Other people's isn't, but I think the two of them do go hand in hand. Um, again, it's a fun question that Chris is asking. Obviously, we're going out to do and get the victory and the three points in both those ties. And what a memorable week we could have as Celtic fans and on the bus. But I think I went over Real Madrid. First time they've played them in my lifetime. That'd be pretty special to me. That'd be pre- and, and by the way, every time we beat Rangers is special as well. Can't deny that. However... I don't know. I think, yeah, I think if you had to make me pick one, I, yeah, I would pick I would pick beating Madrid. But luckily for us, we don't pick one, Jonathan. We want both. Now, one last point, Jonathan, we'll talk about, and you all like talking yeah. about Chris Sutton. I just, I'm yeah. very intrigued to think what his reaction was to this at the weekend, Jonathan. Now, Joe Hart has been commended, he's been praised, uh, has been, you know, what a warrior. And, and by the way, I agree with all that, and I love his attitude. Jonathan, it concerns me, though, that these decisions are getting left with players. Joe Hart was literally getting staples put in his head on the pitch. Yeah. See, for me, 
That's not a manager's decision. He's not a medic. It's not a footballer's decision anymore. They are taken off the part. One rule I would bring in was well, you could say that shouldn't cost you a sub. I think that'd be a good rule when it comes mm-hmm. to that extent. You know, maybe not cost the team a sub. You know, but in either way, Joe Hart shouldn't be continuing that game. Chris Sutton bangs the drum with dimension football from headering a football. How on earth can someone like the size and stature of Stephen Fletcher's boot going into your head at full tilt, you know, mm-hmm. with these studs? How are you possibly then, Jonathan, meant to be carrying on a game of football with a straight head, having had staples put in? It was six, seven minutes. I think once it gets to that stage, Jonathan, it's taken that long for treatment. You're having to change your top, change your shorts because the amount of blood you've lost. It, yeah. This to the head. Uh, yeah, I admire Joe Hart, by the way. I admire him. This is no critique of Joe Hart's attitude to it. I love it. But is he really, Jonathan, in that point in time, the guy that you're trusting to make these calls? Surely that decision should be taken out of his hand and football as a sport should be taking a wee bit more responsibility in that and leaving that with professionals. Yeah, well, it's interesting you ask about Chris Sutton. Chris Sutton did come back on a, on Twitter because he was asked the question that he believes that it should have been a, a substitution made there which won't surprise you uh in the in the slightest uh i think you know when there's that much blood being lost it does seem like it was quite a, a nasty nasty cut uh you know and joe hart's uh, you know fitness health and safety has to come first uh in situations like that um but it, you know it happens so regularly now in football we, just, we, we don't seem to want to take players off and you know even from a footballing perspective it's not as if we don't have a capable goalkeeper on the bench but this isn't even about the footballing decisions that are being made there you're talking about joe hart um as a person they're potentially being seriously hurt uh and you just you don't want to end up you know potentially with him playing on and as you say does take another bang uh to the head and something more serious ends up happening because of the fact we didn't address it in the first instance so i think you've always got to be a bit careful when there is um a knock like that granted they did take their time with him on the pitch the physio must have had a good look at him and thought he was okay to continue do it i particularly liked the thought of him continuing no i did not i think you're right i think you know substitutions like for instance like this would be welcome where they're not going to use you up a sub or they give you a concussion substitution although granted i know that wasn't actually a concussion in this instance he actually had and i guess maybe that's where some people might argue that because it wasn't a concussion then it's not as serious for me i don't really believe that either i just think that the amount of blood loss and the amount of time he was down needing attention was Staples was very concerning like, exactly and then it's you not... know once once i even take away the um the, obviously the main thing is joe hart's health but if that game had continued and joe hart had then conceded a, a very sloppy goal let's say he makes a mistake what's the first thing people are going to be turning around and saying is he's what, head what in the game minutes, properly what happened two minutes later what happened two minutes later after the game restarted do you remember what happened? The, the pass back got made to him. Now, mm. obviously, if you catch the ball, it's a pass back, but he could still have pammed the ball and controlled it. Uh. Joe Hart tries to chase it down awkwardly and puts it out for a corner. Why? Because he is dizzy and disorientated, Jonathan. I don't care what anyone says. Do you not remember that? He kind of leaned yeah, off. Yeah, I, I was, I was a poor back. pass back to him. So I think, but he tried, uh, why I, did he try to chase it, though? Just quickly grab, like, you're allowed to touch the ball where you're at. You like, just control it with your arm and you don't need to catch it. Don't collect the ball. Just let it, just pam it down. He was under no pressure. He tries to chest it like an outfield player. He did that because he was, I'm telling you, he is dis, disorientated. See, for me, don't bother signing backup goalkeepers like Segrist and announce them like that. They were there to come on there, protect the player. Don't take risks with this, Jonathan. I, will, I don't know if anyone's ever seen Chris Sutton crying about his dad. About, you know, I've not seen it. I've heard, I've heard about that. But obviously, so, he does bang the drum a lot about uh, dementia and football, and something's been a big advocate for it for what his dad and, and many others have had to no. go through on that point. But and, when you, you see know, Sutton crying about it, it rings home because that's not Chris Sutton, right? As you know, it's the last thing you expect from Sutton. And when he talks about that and the damage that's been done, I just think he'll have been sitting there shaking his head, going, Just be responsible. Joe Hart comes first. Before anything here, his health comes first. I don't think we need to be at a stage, Jonathan, when we're playing, whether it be Real Madrid or Dundee United, that players are getting stapled on the, you know, on the scalp, Jonathan, to carry on playing a football match. I just think that's, I think we need to move on from that. And I think a lot of people can get all their, 
you know, oh, come on, it's a, you know, it's a man's game and all this bollocks. I'm sorry, I'm not saying that. And Joe Hart, by the way, absolute kudos. Soldier, brave as anything, loved it. But the fact of the matter is, Jonathan, I don't think you need to be doing that. I don't think these decisions should be left to the player. Uh, I think it needs to be someone independent, Jonathan, that makes those calls. And I think there'll be football fans who are med- you know, in the medical profession, Jonathan, watching that on Sky going, kill him off! Screaming at their televisions. I bet you any money. Um, I just, you know, I want to win football matches, but at what cost? I think that if you're getting staples, let's just do a professional job here. Get him and get him there, get him to hospital, whatever it's going to take. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't need your scalp staple, Jonathan, to play a second no. half. At, you know, it's just silly. Very brave of him. I, I admire it. And I think Joe Hart's attitude is just unbelievable. Uh, it was quite a relief in some ways that the uh, the team played so well. So he didn't actually have very, he had very little to do after that. Uh, so we never really got I'm, to see from a I'm footballing you, perspective just how costly that perhaps could have been. That chest um, down moment, mate, I am telling you, was a man who was dis- disorientated. He didn't use his his, his his brain because Jonathan, the balls came back. It's a shite back pass. Just stick out your arm and stop it. Don't need to catch it. He tries to chest it as if he's playing outfield. It was, I mean, he's no thinking straight. Um, I, I just think football's got to be listening to the examples that the likes of Sutty has been telling us for years now. You know, he's given you examples, you know, of, of the damage that's been done just from headering a ball. A player gets a note like that and people are saying, you know, oh, he's only scraped him. It's not been full play. Oh, just stop. He's had a player slide in into his head. He's got staples in the head. I don't give a fuck whether it's a graze or you're saying that or not. Anyone that's losing blood from the, the head or, you know, their scalp, Jonathan, and even the stitched up on the park, just get them off. I, I think... That's a sensible, in my opinion. I'm not being a snowflake about it, Jonathan. I, I know it wasn't always like that in the old days, and Stephen Presley couldn't wait to get his headband on every game, you know, cutting a bit like William Wallace. But, Jonathan, it's it's definitely evident to me that football's not doing enough with these things and aren't obviously taking the warnings and the, the petition and the likes of Chris Sutton are doing because that yesterday is not a decision that should be a footballing one. It should be you know, a medical one, and, and I'm sorry, as soon as you, you need to be giving players staples in the head, they come off the park. Yeah, no, I, I think that is a sensible way, and, and I think football will eventually get there. It's just taking a very long time to get to that stage, which I don't really understand why they're, they're, they're risking players' health um, in the way that they're, they're doing so for just now, and they don't need to be doing that, you know, at the end of the day. It's, uh, it's not worth, you know, potentially doing long-term damage um, to the player, keeping them on the park when they can just need that bit of additional medical mm-hmm. attention. And you're as well making sure the player gets seen to for as long as it takes to make sure there's no other lasting damage that's been done there. And you can't really do that in a five or six minute, just, you know, check up and, and, and halting the bleeding. You'd rather, uh, you know, take your time and, and be able to make sure the player is fully fit um, and, and isn't going to be suffering any serious health problems there. Um, before you end up deciding to, to have them continue playing the game of football. Uh, Did Ange have spared him? Well, yeah, he could have done. Uh, he could have done. I think, obviously, Postacoglu was comfortable with him playing on because there's nothing to say why. You know, if Ange was uh, overly concerned about him playing, then he has that right to make the substitution and take the decision out of Joe Hart's hands, you know. So the manager's decided he's quite comfortable with what his physios told them that Joe Hart can continue um, in the game, and I think that's where they probably lean on their medical advice. But then again, you don't know how much pressure Joe Hart's putting on the physio to say, "I'm still able to go. Don't don't let him sub me off." Because Joe Hart is that type of player that I don't think would want to come off, even if it is, you know, what is in his best interest, health wise, to come off. I think Joe Hart's the type, and he proved it on Sunday that would want to play on unless he absolutely felt he had no other option but to come off. And um, so I think, you know, from Andrew's point of view, yes, he could have stepped in. He's maybe just looked at it and thought, well, the physio's given me the green light, so it's it's okay to, to kind of let this continue in the fact that Joe Hart, as I say, wasn't actually concussed, although granted there was a lot of blood and he's needed staples, as we've touched upon, is maybe why he's been like a little bit more relaxed about it. Certainly more relaxed than I would have been personally, but I think yeah. that's maybe why why Foster Coglu's possibly looked at it and thought, well, the physio's turned around and said he's okay. But at the same time, you know, even when you're, you know, taken away from the obvious, the obvious health issue you have there when something like that happens. He's yeah. also got a very capable backup goalkeeper. I can almost understand that a bit more, you know, if we didn't sign Seacrest in the summer 
and he's looking at it and thinking, oh, Christ, I haven't put Scott Bain or something in, and I really didn't fancy it. And yeah. he, he's maybe gambling a bit more with Joe Hart's health because he just thinks football, footballing decision is going to make us so much weaker as a team if we have to bring on, uh, you know, somebody like a Scott Bain to replace Joe Hart. Um, but, you know, he's got a perfectly capable understudy um, in Secrets. I actually think Secrets will play on Wednesday night. I think he should be playing on Wednesday. He's another one of these players that I think should get minutes um, because that's what he's been brought to the club for. He shouldn't just be sitting on the bench and not getting an opportunity at any given moment. You know, I think the League Cup's the perfect place to throw him yeah, in. Yeah, I would, I would like to see him getting his inclusion then as well. Absolutely. But I, I also agree with you, Jonathan. For me, and see, to be honest with you, whether it's Secrets or not, you should always at Celtic have a capable deputy on the bench. And no matter who it is, when you see an injury like that occur, get them on in place and take charge of that situation. And whether that's Andrew, whether it's someone in Angie's ear, you know, Andrew might be slightly biased because his concern is we need three points. At this point, it was one, one nil. Was it nil nil? No, no, Sorry. it was nil nil. nil, nil. nil. Dundee United almost scored on that attack. What? And the save is a joke. And yeah, maybe that definitely. influences a wee bit. You see, come let's let's then push it a wee bit for that. See, come half time, and you're seeing that up close as a manager, and you're phoning all up. Get him off. Let's get real. Get him off. You know, go yeah. get a shower. No, I agree with get that. Your ass up, get your ass up. Road, you know what I mean? But on that note, we will call it a night, Jonathan. It's been over in 60 minutes. It's been over 150 almost the whole night tonight, by the way. Thank you to everyone wow. who's watched tonight. We went live on. YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. It's been great to see some different names in the comments. And we do try and bring up as many as we can. Have a wee bit of patter with them all as well. I always appreciate everyone's input, whether they agree, disagree, or, or you know, so-so. Also, if you want to hit the like button, please do. If you want to subscribe to the YouTube channel, hit the wee bell. All good. There's also the 199 membership option, which is the same amount as Patreon. Other, but the different services, it's optional and we probably do more shows than any Patreon you are accustomed to. On top of that, we have got to once again say a big thank you to Hoot Travels, who have wanted to work with us this week. Um, we have partnered with them, followed them both on Twitter and Instagram, being the chance to win incredible Celtic prizes at Hoot Travels. Tomorrow they are going to announce we have exclusively revealed on the Boise bus. It's either a signed Jota shirt or a signed Hugo shirt. The bidding might start as low as £3 odds. It might be a wee bit more than that. I'm not privy to that information yet. But it is bargain basement stuff. Get involved. Yeah, get involved. Okay. Absolutely. I'm going to be getting myself involved, I think. I'll buy a wee ticket. I'm buying a ticket right now. There's only 40 up for grabs, guys. Get involved. Uh, and, and it's a like-minded Celtic site. Anyone. Anyway, sorry. Brilliant to have you on the bus, Jonathan. We're going to leave it there. Thanks to everyone yet again for watching. Over to the main man, Chris Sutton. Good night. Cheers. See you later. Some of his comments about me deliberately trying to, to cause contra controversy. Well, I work in the media now. And you've got someone sitting there next to you who's an embarrassment to the media profession. He's an apologist. He's a charlatan. <laughs>